screen. So let's get a little little um, feedback there. That's good. That's good. Uh, I'll be turning you around to face the audience. So So yeah, next is audio from my computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you said? Hello, hello everyone, uh, and welcome, welcome, welcome to our keynote session. Uh, you'll notice that I'm neither John Bowers. Uh, nor Lucy Suchman, but they, they, are, they are up there on the screen, uh, joining us from Toronto, and uh, John, you're, you're in England somewhere. Yes, I'm, I'm in a small village called Coddenham, which is uh, uh, seven miles north of the buzzing metropolis of Ipswich. Yes. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about Ipswich and their football club later. Uh, top of the league, <laughs> top of the league. <laughs> easy, easy. Um, so yeah, uh, the title of this session is Transformative Interfacing, Human-Computer Improvisation and Open Worlds. And rather than uh, give you Lucy and John's bios, uh, which, which you can find on the Sonority's website and countless other places, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the story behind this event uh, from my own personal perspective, and basically why we're here today. Uh, I, I first came across Lucy's work uh, when I was doing my PhD back a while ago. Uh, I think it was in 2001. Um, and I came, I came across Plans and Situated Actions, uh, the full title of which is The Problem of Human-Machine Communication. Uh, at the time, I was developing new instruments and playing with improvising ensembles, and the, the person I was designing instruments with, uh, a metal worker named Neil Fawcett, recommended the book um, um, by Lucy. He had come across it in the 80s. I think it was first came out in 1987. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so I, I thought, he thought, and I later thought, that this might be an interesting way to think about uh, how we relate to each other in systems uh, involving humans and machines. Um, and uh, the, the book and, and my reading of that stayed with me for a while. Um, I'll come back to a bit more about Lucy in a moment. Um, John, I first came across through the NIME literature, New Interfaces for Musical Expression. Uh, and then I think I met him at some point, probably something to do with Simon Waters, our mutual friend, uh, probably maybe here or, or somewhere in England. Uh, John and I then eventually started working together um, uh, more intensely a bit before the pandemic. John was to come here to be a visiting professor um, for, for a number of years, uh, and that was um, in March 2020. And then, you know, the pandemic happened, and, that, and we thought, oh, no, we can't do that anymore. Uh, so we decided to then embark on a series of tragic experiments uh, where we connected uh, to each other through Zoom and Teams and all the horrible communication tools that we have at our disposal uh, and, and turned them all on at the same time, uh, opened our arms to latency and jitter and all the rest that, um, and feedback that came with that and, and tried to make sense of um, that particular situation through uh, improvised music making with these telecommunication systems. Um, that, that culminated in a piece called How Our Suffering is Multiplied, um, which uh, we, we performed at ISTA's Sonic Practice Now, which was an online event back in August 2020. And then we later went on with Adam Pulse Melby to form Three Body Problem. That's another group that continues to explore similar relationships, both through online communication systems, but also with our um, instruments as well some of which may have computers, some of which may have other types of machines. Um, 
So, yeah, so Lucy's work originally, I, I don't think explicitly gets into improvisation, even though it really suggests that to me and, and, and plenty of other people, that what she was writing about would be relevant to that case. Um, but I, I think I first, um, actually I first met Lucy from, from a distance, actually I've never, I don't think I've ever met you in person, Lucy, it's always been over Zoom, um, through an event uh, that was uh, co-organized by Nicola Himes, who's here as well in the room, um, who, as a, a quick plug, will be playing at the Black Box later tonight. Um, Nicola was part of a group called Comparing Domains of Improvisation uh, at Columbia University, who was organizing online events uh, during the pandemic, and Lucy gave a talk there, um, which she, uh, in which I found really fascinating, where she kind of was explicitly engaging with improvisation and critical improvisation studies as a field. I found out about the event, actually not through Nicola, but through my colleague Sarah Ramshaw, who's a, a lawyer and legal scholar who I've collaborated with, um, and she was presenting the month before, and it was just by chance I noticed Lucy's name on the program and checked that out. It was a really interesting conversation. George Lewis was there as well. Um, and of course, though, um, the relationship between Lucy's work and you know this type of music making uh, wasn't in my, my first encounter with that wasn't that event, although that was probably the first time where improvisation was at the fore. Um, already in her Human Machine Reconfigurations, um, which was published in 2007, uh, we see her beginning to dialogue with, with music explicitly, and, and John as well, so John features in the introduction. Um, so I'm actually aware that John and Lucy's relationship goes back um, many years before that, and the, Probably the main motivation for this event uh, for me was to bring these two particular people together back into some kind of improvised dialogue. Because I think there's, there's rich connections that are yet to be fully explored uh, in that relationship. And I, and I hope we get to see a taste of that today. Um, I could say more about their history or the theme of this session and indeed the wider theme of our Sonority Symposium um, events, which we've had some great uh, speakers here for the last few days. Um, the focus of which was on human computer improvisation. Uh, that's an intention, intentional abuse of HCI, uh, or human computer interaction, um, a move that I borrowed actually from John, who ran a workshop on that human computer improvisation many years back. Um, but I'll leave these elaborations to John and Lucy. I think I've talked enough. The only thing I have left to say uh, is that the format of the session will start with a presentation by Lucy, uh, roughly 20 minutes followed by a film essay by John, um, 26 minutes and 21 seconds, uh, and, and then an open conversation between the two of them, and we'll see where we go from there. Uh, so I'm going to turn this camera around so that they can see the people in the room. That's, yep, there we go. <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to the... Pen Lucy's. So a nice shot of Lucy there. Uh, so yeah, please join me in, in, in welcoming Lucy to start with. Yes. Great. Well, um, I want to start by thanking Paul and the Sonorities Festival Deltas for the invitation uh, to be with you, albeit virtually. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, and I'm also very grateful uh, for the opportunity to reconnect with John, uh, who, as Paul suggested, um, I've known for some three decades, I would say, um, but hadn't seen in a very long time before today. And I'm going to, to travel back over some of the ground um, that Paul has already uh, laid out, in, in, including um, some of what I brought to the Comparing Domains of Improvisation um, event. Um, so I'll take this um, opening statement uh, as a chance, and, and I can't help but being struck by how resonant it is already, uh, the, temp the times that, that Paul was able to provide for each of us. And, you know, that kind of uncertainty, um, in my case, uh, the timing that I've done by word counts and checking to see, you know, how many words in a 20 minute speech and all those things. Right. And, and again, here I am already improvising on 
what I had planned to say. And so that's going to wander some seconds here and there. Um, and I think it's just interesting to think about that in relation to John's film essay uh, as, as genre uh, in, in relation to our topic. So um, I wanted to, to take this opening statement as a chance to offer some, some context um, on my relation to our theme of transformative interfacing and human computer improvisation, um, and to put some thoughts on the collective table um, that might serve, I hope, as provocations um, for, for our conversation to come. So I come to this topic, as Paul indicated, not as a musician, sadly, um, but rather as a science and technology studies or SDS scholar. Um, and But human computer improvisation uh, first became salient for me in the 1970s uh, at the intersection of uh, what was then an immersion for me in interactionist social theory on the one hand, and then a serendipitous but also life-changing encounter with the project of designing interactive machines uh, at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center, also known as PARC, um, where I ended up spending the next 20 years. Um, so I was a PhD student in anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley at the time, uh, and my advisor um, was Gerald Berriman, who was an interactionist anthropologist anthropologist um, interested in questions of social inequality. So Berman had done his own PhD research on the Indian caste system, and, and he started out in a very small village um, in the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, so caste identity in that context effectively came with birth. Um, one was known and recognized as an individual of the caste into which one was born, and that was your identification throughout um, your life. But then um, Berriman relocated to a nearby small city, um, and he was struck uh, by the question of, okay, how does caste identification work in circumstances where caste is just as salient, but where interactions are now among strangers? So making discriminations, uh, positioning another as other, was now a matter not of individual recognition, but of real-time, moment-to-moment assignments of social identity based on readings of a range of visual, behavioral, contextual signs. And it was this that led Berman to a more radically interactionist analysis of how social identification and social orderings more broadly get done. And that interactionist sensibility and also the politics around that uh, was our strong connection, and it deeply informed my own early engagements with, um, with human-computer interaction, just being named that at the time, uh, as well as with cognitive science and artificial intelligence. And uh, Berman's writing also then subsequently provided me uh, with an epigraph uh, for my own PhD thesis, uh, which was published um, as Paul said in 1987, as the book Plans and Situated Actions. Um, and the epigraph uh, draws on a trope of navigation to, to set up two figures, which I mobilized to frame the question of relations between plans and situated actions. Um, and this was, this was relevant uh, in particular because my colleagues and protagonists at the time were cognitive and computer scientists who were working in the then planning paradigm of AI. So I'm going to reread that passage here, and I'm hoping that you can listen for the resonances um, with your own practices, um, with whatever forms of prescriptive representation they might involve, um, whether that's genre, scores, scripts, um, or the like. Uh, so here's the epigraph from Berriman, he writes. Thomas Gladwin has written a brilliant article contrasting the method by which the Trekkies of Micronesia navigate the open sea with that by which Europeans navigate. He points out that the European navigator begins with a plan, a course, which is charted according to certain universal principles, and he carries out his voyage by relating his every move to that plan. The Trekkies navigator begins with an objective rather than a plan. He sets off toward the objective and responds to conditions as they arise in an ad hoc fashion. He utilizes information provided by the wind, the waves, the tide and current, the fauna, the stars, um, 
the clouds, the sound of the water on the side of the boat, and he steers accordingly. His effort is directed to doing whatever is necessary to reach the objective. If asked, he can point to his objective at any moment, but he cannot describe his course. That's the end of the quote. So my point in citing um, this excerpt was not to set up uh, the Truckee's navigator as, as other to the European, um, though there are certainly differences that matter in Truckee's and European knowledge systems. But the argument that I go on to make in the book is that however planned, all activity, even the most routine, is radically situated. Plans um, and other kinds of prescriptive representations are not, um, in other words, determining algorithms, but they're artifacts that set up relations through which we can orient our practices and to which our practices might be held accountable. Our ongoing practices, for example, um, this event as it unfolds, are enacted always in and through specific social and material circumstances. So in this sense, one could argue that we all act like truckees, however much some of us may talk like Europeans. And we must act like the truckees because the circumstances of our own ongoing practice are constituted in crucial measure through that same practice. Uh, and this is a really important point because context um, is not a kind of surround on this view, but it's reflexively generated through the practices that it informs. And um, I should note here that John and I are both fans of uh, feminist physicist uh, Karen Barad. Um, John's paper, The Virtual is Material, Music, Improvisation, and Post-Digital Ecologies, draws on, on Barad's work. Um, and as Barad writes in her wonderful book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, she says, uh, we're not outside the world, um, but nor are we inside it. Rather, we are part of the world's becoming. So 20 years after the publication of Plans and Situated Actions, I published a sequel titled Human Machine Reconfigurations. And now I want to read you the short preface to that book, which begins again with epigraphs. Um, so the first two passages are uh, excerpts from anthropologist Tim Ingold's book, um, The Perception of the Environment, Essays in Livelihood, Dwelling, and Skill. And in this passage, it turns out he's writing about playing music. So he writes, I experienced a heightened sense of awareness, but that awareness is not of my playing. It is my playing. Just as with speech or song, the performance embodies both intentionality and feeling, but the intention is carried forward in the activity itself. It does not consist in an internal mental representation formed in advance and lined up for instrumentally assisted bodily execution. And the feeling likewise is not an index of some inner emotional state for it inheres in my very gestures. So that's the first quote. And then a second passage from the same text by Ingold, he writes, if we want to know what words like nature and technology mean, then rather than seeking some delimited set of phenomena in the world as though one could point to them and say, there, that's nature or that's technology, we should be trying to discover what sorts of claims are being made with these words and whether they are justified. In the history of modern thought, these claims have been concerned above all with the ultimate supremacy of human reason. So this is Ingold writing in 2000. The next two passages, uh, and these are all, again, the, the preface to my, uh, my book, Human Machine Reconfiguration. So the next two passages are from John Bowers, Improvising Machines, Ethnographically Informed Design for Improvised Electroacoustic Music, published in 2003. So John writes, I bring down my finger onto the cue and turn the knob down with a whole arm twist, which I continue into a whole body turn as I disengage from both knob and key. SOH, that's John's uh, collaborator, brings in a low quiet sound precisely as I find myself turned to face him. We're in the valley before the finale. I turn back to the synthesizer front panel and gradually swell sound cue into the intense texture that it's required to be. At maximum, I hold my right hand over the volume control and bring in my left to introduce a high frequency boost and then a modulation to the filtering. 
As I turn the knobs, I gradually lean towards the front panel. When the modulation is on the edge of excess, I lean back and face SOH. He looks over. I move my left hand away from the panel, leaving my right poised on the volume knob. I arch myself backwards a little further and then project my torso down while turning the knob anti-clockwise. I continue my hand through and away from the panel. SOH has also stopped playing. As the considerable reverberation dies down, we relax together, face the audience, and gently pat, bow. We have finished. Uh, and then the second ex excerpt. Quote, the image of impro improvised electroacoustic music that I want to experiment with is one where these contingencies of place, structure, technology, and the rest are not seen as problematic obstructions to an idealized performance, but are topicalized in performance itself. Improvised electroacoustic music on this account precisely is that form of music where those affairs are worked through publicly and in real time. The contingency of technology-rich music-making environments is the performance thematic. The whole point is to exhibit the everyday embodied means by which flesh and blood performers engage with their machines in the production of music. The point of it all does not lie elsewhere or in addition to that. It is in our abilities to work with and display a manifold of human machine relationships that our accountability of performance should reside." End quote. So this preface by way of this extended um, set of epigraphs marked the, the frame for, for my book and introduced its themes. Uh, the irreducibility of lived practice as it's embodied and enacted, the value of empirical investigation over categorical debate, the displacement of reason from a position of supremacy to one among many, way, uh, many ways of knowing and, 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 and acting, the heterogeneous socio-materiality and the real-time contingency of performance, and the new agencies and accountabilities that are affected through reconfigured relations of human and machine. And as I wrote, that these excerpts appeared as a preface to my book reflected the contingent practicalities of the authoring process itself, because coming upon these books after having finished my own, I found them so richly consonant with its themes that they could not be left unacknowledged. Well, so while in some sense they appear as a kind of afterthought, their position at the beginning is meant to give them pride of place. Moreover, their responsiveness each to the other, however unanticipated, sets up a resonance that seemed in turn to clarify and extend my argument in ways that were both familiar to me but also new. So taken together, Ingold's painstaking anthropology of traditional and contemporary craftwork and Bauer's experimental ethnography of emerging future practices of improvising machines work to trace the arc of my own arguments my own argument in ways that I hoped would then become clear uh, in the pages that followed. So I'm not gonna follow that arc in detail here, um, but instead just draw on it to open up some questions that I hope we can talk about together about improvisation and its implications for thinking about human machine relations and also about differences that, that matter. And so now I'm going to um, share my screen. And hope you can see that. So, uh, it should say some topics. Good. So, um, so the first topic is uh, the the uh, interface um, as a site. Just making sure that is the first one. The interface as a site for configuring the user on the one hand versus the interface as human machine reconfigurations in play on the other. And I think John may speak to this, but um, there's a, a, a very nice trope about uh, the human computer interface developed by um, Steve Wolgar many years ago, uh, which he, are to, he, he characterizes as what the interface does is to configure the user, which was a really provocative and interesting formulation at the time. But how can we rethink that into this much more dynamic kind of relational um, conceptualization. Uh, next, um, improvisation 
as about enacting an accountable relation between prescriptive representations and situated actions. Uh, and, and here I'm using this general category of prescriptive rep representations, as I kind of indicated earlier, to reference any kind of device that serves as what interaction analyst Fred Erickson names uh, production resources, um, whether that's for intelligibility in everyday conversation or for per performing a piece of music. So I'm thinking about improvisation in the sense not of the alternative to you know, executing a plan, as we say, or a procedure or a score, but as what is actually required to do that, the improvisation that's necessary for accountable action. Um, and we could take the favorite analogy in computer science, which is, well, com that compares you know, an algorithm to a recipe. So how can we recognize, if we think about recipes and cooking, how how can we recognize the difference between cooking according to a recipe on one hand and say inventing a new dish uh, on the other and also the necessary improvisations that are required that are presupposed um, by the recipe we could say more about that um, but this has implications for grasping both the determinant relation of code to computational processes and the irremediable indeterminacies and contingencies of computing in and as social practice. And you, of course, can think about um, the specificities of this in relation to musical performance. The, uh, the next, um, the idea of responsibility, a kind of re rewording that comes from um, Donna Haraway and other feminist scholars. Um, so responsibility, which I find really generative in thinking about differences um, between us and our machines, uh, which we could talk more about, uh, and attendant questions of subjectivity, justice, and what's at stake. Um, and this third uh, question that we that I hope we can discuss is, is inspired by reading George Lewis's essay, Machine in Perens Listening as Improvisation, and more specifically, his interest in what he names um, machine subjectivities and listening as a capacity of machines. And I, and I have to say, I feel some very strong resistance toward these formulations. The question of subjectivity and, the, and of the capacity for listening is tied for me to that of responsibility, the ability to respond as the grounds for social being. So however entangled responsibility might be with the more than human, the machinic, um, adjudications of social justice, it seems to me, come back to us in our humanness, as do responsibilities for the technologies um, that we create. And it's for that reason that I find myself returning to questions of subject-object difference when faced with the figure of the interactive or human-like machine, and to the specificities, but also the limits of machine agency and their, the implications of that, particularly in realms where care or injury are at stake. This is part for me of tracking closely the elision of difference in discourses of machine intelligence. And in my current work, I focus on the military concept of situational awareness and more specifically the requirements of um, positive identification uh, of something that constitutes an imminent threat that underwrite the canons of legalized killing. Um, and I'm thinking about the trope of situational awareness here through related questions of intelligibility and identification, and more particularly through a frame inspired by Judith Butler's theoretical analysis of recognition's performative and generative agencies. Um, again, we could talk more about that. Um, and then finally, um, agencies at the interface um, thinking about what I think of as both expanding the frames of the interface and being accountable for the cuts um, that we make to delineate it. Um, and let me just share a, a, a few examples um, to, to illustrate, elaborate this, this last point. Um, so one uh, example is drawn from, um, from my my. It's an example I, I explore in my book, um, and it's uh, performance artist Stellark's um, prosthetic head. This is a, a frame from a video recording of me and the head um, at the Interaccess Gallery in Toronto in the spring of 2003. And as you can see, the head is a 
a three-dimensional graphical simulacrum of the artist's own head, um, endowed with the capacity to take queries that are typed on a keyboard and to respond in automatically generated speech. And you can see that the head was displayed in this larger than life-size dimension on the walls of an otherwise darkened room, and there were no other accompanying artifacts um, than a, this pedestal holding a standard computer keyboard. Uh, and that's, that's me at this, at this keyboard. What made this encounter a really interesting one for me, however, was that Stellark was also present as part of the assemblage um, because the head was in its early um, uh, exhibitions and he was, he was interested to see um, the responses. Uh, and he was interested, um, because I, I got to, to speak with him about this, in what he describes as the seductive couplings that occur between the head and its interlocutors. But my concern is less with the response of humans to human-like machines than with how, in what ways, human-like machines respond to us. And it's there, I argue, that it's helpful to articulate differences in the resources that are available to people and machines in constructing a mutually intelligible world. So articulating those differences suggests the value of a shift from treating machines as almost or quasi humans to recognizing their particular machinic agencies. And it also involves expanding the frame, as I said, and being accountable for cuts. So for example, Stellark's presence in this event and what it means to, as he does, delineate the head as an autonomous agent. Um, all sorts of interesting things to think about there, including what constituted the interface um, and, and was Stellark. Uh, and, and, and for me, he was an integral part of that. Um, so the question of, th this question of, of frames um, and cuts, uh, has become newly salient, of course, uh, in light of the current frenzy over um, AI um, in its current manifestation of machine learning. Uh, and here's a useful rendering um, that many of you may have seen that depicts um, the vastness of the assemblage uh, of the machine if we expand the frame further. So this is uh, Kate Crawford and Vladimir Jolaire's uh, exploded diagram of the Amazon Echo. And they start from a single interaction with the device Alexa, uh, which was featured in Amazon's uh, early promotional videos, um, the command, Alexa, turn on the hall lights. Um, and as they write in the long essay that accompanies the diagram, which I know you can't read, so just the gestalt, I guess, of the, of the extent and complexity, they write, in this fleeting moment of interaction, a vast matrix of capacities is invoked interlaced chains of resource extraction, human labor, and algorithmic processing across networks of mining, logistics, distribution, prediction, and optimization. The scale of this system is almost beyond human imagining. How can we begin to see it, to grasp its immensity and complexity as a connected form? And then finally, um, let me close uh, with an example um, of the kind of transformative interfacing that I take it is of most interest here. Um, so this is a, a screenshot from a performance installation from the early 2000s. Uh, computational media artist Cha Jin Wei works working with what he names um, responsive media spaces, uh, like this uh, tea garden, which is an installation that's populated by costume participants who are instrumented with sensors, real-time tracking receivers, and media synthesis generators. Um, and as Jinwei describes it in a, in a wonderful paper titled, Resistance is Fertile, um, and I'll show you this quote, um, he writes, the, the tea garden software tracks gesture rather than recognizes gesture, because at no place in the software is there a model that codes the gesture. The software does not infer what the player means by her gesture. It merely tracks the gesture and continuously synthesizes responses. So what we have done is to set aside entirely the problem of inferring human intent from behavior, or more generally, from observables. Yet by providing and even thickening the sensuous response, we make fertile the substrate for agency. This approach remains agnostic as to whether movements are intentional, the responsive system simply does not need to know. 
So it's in projects like this, uh, on my view, that the specific capacities of computing are under investigation and configuration in forms that also more radically rework traditional imaginaries of the human. So that at least is one sense of transformative interfacing. Uh, and I look forward to, to talking about more um, as, we, as we go forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, next up, I will cue a film. One moment. Oop, before I do that, I must rewind it as to not totally give the game away. <laughs> there we go. Uh, and it's shared for sound. Okay. So, Please welcome John in his film essay form. <laughs> Please on. It took me a while to track down my old friend, the professor. He has become something of a recluse in a small village in the east of England. He told me that he has acquired a new nickname, Old Bootloader, and he rather likes it. They call him this in the village shop and the pub. His passions seem concentrated, less diffuse these days, and directed towards making arcane musics. He had not forgotten his old struggles, though, and was happy to give me advice over the lecture I was about to give. First, he said, you must tell them about empires, about how they rise and fall, how the sedentary give way to the nomadic, and how the nomadic settle and become dominant, only to fall again. Tell them how this was known to Ibn Khaldun in the 14th century, and how Deleuze and Guattari acknowledge their debt to him in two citations and a footnote in Mille Plateau, but could have made him a third author. Tell them of the two ghosts that haunt us, fascism and madness. You can hint at this, with some of those images of surveillance and infrastructure that you are fond of, old military installations, your trip to the DMZ in Korea, and images of collapse, perhaps the destruction of Ionopolis. So first, empire.
Second, said old bootloader, you need to connect these thoughts to technology. Your audience will like that. They will be expecting remarks about AI. Doubtless many of them will have forgotten that it stands for artificial intelligence. Uh, but don't do that. Tell them about the proliferation of nuclear weapons. How, aside from the very first time, no one has successfully tested a bomb on the basis of published physics alone and without having someone on the team who has already worked on a successful test. Even if their participation was secured through espionage or kidnapping. Tell them that this means that the bomb can be uninvented through test bans and waiting for all those with the knowledge to die out. Tell them that if nukes can be uninvented, so can anything else. Show them documentary film of early tests accompanied by melancholic music. So, second, the contingencies of technology.
Third, he said, continuing from this, talk about your fascination with the details of work, of the practices by which things are made, of how we should reject ideas of Aristotelian hylomorphism, whereby ideas somehow <coughs> take material form, and think of more subtle entanglings of bodies and materials. Remind them of how some 20 years ago you brought this perspective to thinking about your own practice as a musical <coughs> improviser, or you did as well as you could back then. Don't show them your own musical work just yet, Perhaps show them some film you have shot of people at work and invite your audience to do a bit of workplace ethnography. So, third, the work to make it work. Remember your old thinking about the very idea of an interface, old bootloader asked me, that paper you wrote over 30 years ago, where you argued that we should replace the concept of the interface with the practice of interfacing. I think they might like that. You can challenge them to rethink the separations, attributions, localizations and problematizations they make or take for granted whenever they talk of interfaces. As an added bonus, you could note how many classic thought experiments in philosophy do interfacing to convince you of things you might otherwise resist. 
Plato's cave, Turing's imitation game, Searle's Chinese room. These are all ontological traps for the unwary. Show them how you think of interfaces in an extended sense in your own work, and make sure you show them that funny blob detection movie where you wear a false beard to impersonate me and claim that you have made a machine that reads minds. Fourth, from interfaces to interfacing. If they are on your side, I think you can now offer a whole bunch of speculative strategies, tactics and open questions. Fifth and finally, what if interfacing becomes the very subject matter of an art? How might we rethink tools, instruments, technologies, if separations and the rest were provisional or uncertain? How might we go about making? We certainly wouldn't wish to emulate capitalist commodity production with its separations of labour and value. How can we think of performance as performance, as forming through? Tell them, ask not what's in the artefact, but what the artefact is in. That will get them to think ecologically. Yes, performance ecologies and ecosystems. And who might do all this questioning and making and playing? An improvisatory community. A community that values situatedness, action, in specific settings and moments. Imminence, working from within. Materialism, working close to materials. Conviviality, living and working with others. Things, artifacts in the making. Infrastructures, communities of practice, resource networks. Entanglements, all of the above together. An improvisatory community, a coming community of lovers, inoperative, confronted, disavowed, of impure belonging. Fifth and finally, steering clear of fascism and madness, uninventing the bomb, the children of the mantic stain. <laughs>
Right. So we have about a half an hour left. Hello, I can see you from this side as well. Um, and to kick off this half hour, I would like to invite uh, John and Lucy to uh, talk to each other. <laughs> and we can see what happens from there. Right, take it away. Well, hello. Um, just to, just to kick things off, I think it's just very interesting the difference in forms that we uh, undertook in, in working with this. Now, um, I should say in my case, this is partly due to uh, a personal contingency and that I had to leave uh, Belfast early in the week on a family affair. And it, and it wasn't, and for a while it was a bit touch and go whether I'd be able to participate this afternoon at all. And so I thought, actually, the most flexible uh, to support my participation this afternoon was mm -hmm. a fixed media thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so 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 much for your you know contradictions between fixed and unfixed media. The most flexible was a fixed media thing, uh, so that at least there'd be something I could show. But also, I think the um, uh, the film essay format that I've kind of. Uh, slightly adopted or been experimenting with for a few years um, it is a very, I think, interesting form for um, uh, handling some of the concerns that we have. Um, uh, I have in mind also um, Ursula Le Guin's room, um, uh, the, the grab bag of fiction, uh, which uh, um, Donna Haraway uh, mm -hmm. quotes uh, very favorably a number of times. And the idea that fiction, uh, her fiction could be a grab bag. Uh, uh, something that you carry with you, uh, something that can contain lots of different things. And before, before I read uh, 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 Le Guin, I was uh, also uh, thinking about holdalls, you know, ways in which if, if we wanted to proliferate uh, different forms of uh, art making, if we wanted to engage in uh, 
uh, you know, uh, multiplicity, heterogeneous interfacing, you know, do, do all of that kind of jazz. What kind of thing would you want that could somehow hold it all? And, uh, and to me, the film essay, and I, you know, I particularly sort of have in mind uh, practitioners like Chris Marker and others, is, is, is a way of doing this, uh, uh, a, a way of, of bringing together uh, uh, music, narration, text, um, speculation, uh, personal experience. And, um, and that's, uh, that's the attraction for me. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I love your, your film essay. And, um, uh, you know, I think my comment about, about the, the temporalities of these different genre was more a reflection of an anxiety over the length of my own than anything else. Um, but with an end, and I think that question about, you know, what counts as, as flexibility and in, in, in the, the sort of multiplicity of ways of, of constituting flexibility, something, things that can accommodate, things that can, um, is, is a really interesting one and, and should definitely not be reduced to whether it's live or recorded or um, because it's it's much more complicated and contingent than that, and I love the film essay and and of course it, um, you know the the ways in which your film essay brings in sound, um, the the sonic, uh, which is something that I feel I'm as a very textually oriented person. Um, very kind of oblivious to the presence of sound, um, to my own, um, the, the power and agencies of sound. And so I, I, fa I found it really beautiful and, and very powerful in that way. And of course, also I loved the interweaving of your, your narrative accounts with, with the sound and imagery and with your own performance um, or the performance of you and your family, I guess, <laughs> or your, your collaborators. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, it was lovely. And it's kind of right that we've each expressed ourselves in the ways that we, in the different ways that we do. And at the same time, I'm struck again by how much unplanned resonance there is because we really have not spoken to each other for a very long time. Although, 300 years, yes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. And, and um, so that those, there's something, there, there are lines of connection that are, are and, and resonance that are obviously really strong and recurring. And I think that's really interesting. And even around, because all of my work these days is around um, basically uh, demilitarization and, mm -hmm. um, and critical work on mm. on military imaginaries of mm. AI and uh, computing, and so that obviously we're both continue to be haunted <laughs> by mm. by that, and um, that that's that was really interesting, and yeah. I I, I mean I think it's like um, uh, uh, extremely timely that you've you've turned your attention. Uh, to those to those affairs, uh, Lucy. I'm uh, really really pleased about that. Uh, I, I, it, it's um, I'm I'm not sure. You know, uh, myself. I mean, I've thought you know quite deeply about our situation at the moment and uh, and how uh, warmongering is uh, a fixed feature for many forms of statecraft and governance at the moment. Uh, you know, either to uh, inspire or enslave a local population. Or to permeate myths of uh, of, uh, of of nation, or 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 to or to impose various uh, identities in various ways, and to territorialize them uh, while deterritorializing others. Um, and sometimes I kind of wonder whether you know I really should be pissing around with those little microcontrollers, uh, which I touch mm -hmm. and which I make go we were and. Uh, I mean, John Richards, uh, musician, and I have a, a joke that we have a thousand and one ways of going, right? Uh, you know, lots of different ways of doing that, you know. Um, but we always sound like the same, 
right? Uh, unless when we do sort of melancholic D Dorian uh, synthesizer <laughs> drones. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, and, and that's, uh, um, I, I suppose, I'm not sure whether this, where this is leading to me is to, mm. make, to make a remark, uh, but there are circumstances about our, our current historical condition which, uh, which, which trouble me. And, uh, sure. and, and, and whether there's something that people with have some kind of improvisatory culture can actually speak to mm-hmm. radically uh, sure. uh, right sure. now. Yeah, I mean, I want to get to the audience, so I don't want to uh, go on too long. But I think um, thinking about your um, your modes of, of computing as a kind of how it, you know, an, an otherwise computing otherwise, right? I mean, what you're doing there is antithetical to the project that has characterized the relations between computing and the military since the very beginning. And actually, I started to get involved with that in the 1980s around mm-hmm. computer control of nuclear weapon systems. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, you know, you're doing a counter, a, a counter um, computational practice there. Um, which, which I think, combined with the critical work, um, is is really important, and it you know opens up this question, opens up the question of closed and open worlds, which we've also sort of inserted into our title, um, which is something that I'm very preoccupied with at the moment, and tracing the closed world imaginaries from that Paul Edwards describes in his book uh, of that title around the Cold War through Vietnam through the so-called war on terror um, to, to the current moment of the de- US Defense Department's joint all domain command and control, which again is what Edwards characterized as this uh, dome of, of global technological oversight. And that is, that is the, the, the world of control reason, um, you know, the, the hegemonic uh, place of, of control and, and reason. Uh, and disembodiment and abstraction and dehumanization. So um, working those against each other and playing with the sort of open worlds that are involved in your improvisational practice or maybe in improvisational practice, you know, more, more widely, I, th- I think that's a form of counter, mm. um, counter effort that, uh, that's extremely important. Um, I mean, on, on a good day, I feel the same. Um, but yeah. I think it's I, I I think also the growing of communities communities of resistance uh, is is uh, is is very important and I think the the the, the fifth point that old bootloader said to whoever it was who made that film um, <laughs> uh, the the different ways in which ideas of community can be formulated and uh, mm-hmm. and old yes. bootloader's last uh, remarks was. Uh, a, a, a listing of uh, every fancy French theorist uh, from Bataille onwards, uh, Bataille, Nancy, Blanchot, oh, and Agamben, who's not French, um, and, and finishing up with a, uh, a phrase from um, uh, English surrealist uh, feminist artist Eiffel Colhoun, children of Mantic Stain. And, um, and, and I think trying to find some way of, of formulating community and formulating uh, resistive communities is 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 what I'm, I'd I'd also be very concerned to do to 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 you know embed the the yeah. the, the noodling and other practices that some of us are engaged in yes. uh, uh, within with a bigger reach and uh, a, 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 a greater political presence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe just to throw in there that I think we're all. We're both also um, fans of Phil Agri's idea of critical technical practice, um, which I really recommend to people. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the idea that the, the 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 things that are are in some respects could be seen as as challenges or threats to your practice are actually themselves the the most important generative moments. Um, and I've I feel that I'm increasingly meeting um, young people in computing who are seriously embracing that and in alliance with other social movement um, activists uh, in very, you know, um, heartening kinds of inspirational kinds of ways. So, yeah, I agree completely. 
So maybe we could see if. Um, yeah. Can, if just to, just to check, Lucy, can you hear me okay if I speak from here? Can you, is this coming through? Yeah, yes. yeah, it's okay, I think it. I, so, uh, let's, let's take it out to the audience. Are there anybody with any comments or questions for Lucy and John? Yeah, if you, uh, let's try projecting from there, and or you could walk up here and, and speak to them in the camera. Let's. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, John, it's, it's largely in response to your, your wonderful uh, video. Um, but uh, the, the talk uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the topic of ritual came up, and um, I'm just really interested in, in your thoughts on this. Um, and how we sort of how we're kind of culturally sensitive, and sort of not reckless in our in our uh, improvised practices. Because I think you know the past has shown us that sometimes these uh, chaotic approaches can sort of um, um, yeah uh, 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 be, be a bit difficult. And I'm responding to this motif of steering clear of uh, fascism and madness. I'm interested in, in when you mentioned this Aristotelian notion of ideas taking material form, and it just brought to mind. Uh, that sort of uh, the, the, the esoteric concept of the egregore, kind of the collective thought forms that you know that, that kind of uh, become material, um, and also theory fiction, but also how theory fiction can sort of can, can mask some of these more um, really seeding kind of negative uh, um, ideologies. I'm thinking of test realism, accelerationism, people like Nick Land being kind of bankrolled by you know the likes of Peter Thiel. And do you think that we should not interface at all with this kind of Cyber fascist sort of Silicon Valley e um, um, e egoism, and just you know uh, go our own sort of other way. Um, and how can improvising deconstruct these sort of top of the pyramid, top down, you know, hegemonic and kind of um, imperialist uh, structures? Um, I, I, I don't know uh, any sense. Thanks. Just say your name it as well. Makes a bit too much sense. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, lot, lots, lots to respond to there. Um, uh, I'll just pick off a few things from what you've said. Yeah, I don't think we should have any truck with fascists. Um, I don't think, and I think we should uh, 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 feel when the temptations are growing and feel when the ambiguities have a sense, a long distance sense, a long range sense of, of, of what's being played with. Uh, however, uh, I think there's also, there are, you know, widespread discontents, uh, widespread discontents that people relate to identities, identities lost, uh, uh, historical opportunities thwarted, uh, and those sorts of things can be engaged with. The, the lost histories, the lost aspirations that many people have from the past, uh, the, the, the sense in which uh, uh, the little boy who you saw at the beginning of my uh, film essay, uh, he could go to university, he could do a PhD from a working class background that was fully paid for uh, without any debt and with actually having quite a lot of money left over at Christmas in the first semester. <laughs> um, uh, and the, 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 the loss of certain kinds of history, certain kinds of possibilities is something to engage in. And, fa and, and a lot of right wing thinking engages with that and has mobilized that in a particular, particularly toxic way, uh, usually by identifying another, uh, a scapegoat other, um, or, or a, a mysterious process which has, um, you know, led to that thwarting. Um, and, and those are the kinds of patterns that we should be alert to. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, let's have, uh, let's have no truck with fascists. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the steering a line, it's not exactly their metaphor, but uh, the, the, between the Scylla and the Charybdis of uh, fascism and madness is a, phrase, is a, is a formulation of Deleuze and Guattari's, and uh, which, uh, which I, quite, I quite like. Uh, you know, if we follow the way of the, of the state, of the sedentary, uh, of authority, uh, of, of, of certain forms of rationality and refine those, uh, then we are tempted by fascism. Uh, uh, but if we if we equally go for nomad thinking, massive proliferation of alternatives, uh, then then we might go mad. Uh, 
Um, and I think those are reasonable, <laughs> you know, warnings. Um, so I've just picked off one thing from a, a very rich set of things you asked about there, and I'm not going to say a little bit about reason, uh, about ritual at the moment, because I've talked too much. Lucy, do you want to come in there with anything in response to? Um, I, I'd be happy to go on. I would just say that I think um, that Peter Thiel and company are, are just exactly um, the problem. Uh, you know, they are part of the assemblage that constitutes that which we need to resist and at every possible opportunity. I'll leave it with that. <laughs> Great. Um, anybody else? Comments or questions? Um, I have quite a few, if nobody else <laughs> wants to go. Um, yeah, what, one thing that uh, is both in the title and also occurred in both your talks is this idea of uh, interfacing, or the interface uh, verbing things as, as we do. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that from each of your different perspectives, not necessarily aiming to reconcile them into, uh, but I, actually, I'm quite interested in a diffractive view on the concept of interface or inter interfacing from both of you. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I could I could start. I guess um, the 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 way that I've thought about this, I guess, has been think, thinking in terms of agencies. Um, and distributions uh, of, of agencies, um, and uh, so so trying to get away from the idea of, of um, the interface as the uh, surface um, on you know on one side of which is the machine and on the other side of which is is um, the the person, um, and uh, instead thinking about the dynamic distributions redistributions of agencies um, and how that's inflected by our con our conceptions of agency um, and the kind of re radical reworkings of, of those that I think are, are ongoing in a, in a number of fields um, to a much more radically relational understanding um, of, of agency. Um, and at the same time, um, I'm, you know, very committed to uh, this articulation of difference that I mentioned um, between uh, us and our technologies, broadly speaking. Um, and of course, we can ask, who do you mean us, um, <laughs> white woman? <laughs> um, you know, so we're, we don't, we don't, whenever we refer to us, to humans, to et cetera, we're, we're uh, you know, we're in need of further specification. But um, to, uh, to, to, and that's where the idea of responsibility comes in for me. And, you know, to me, if we understand the specificities, the, spe the specificities of the agencies of computational technology uh, in this case, and those are different um, from the agencies of the kinds of animals that we are, um, that doesn't make computation any less interesting to me. It makes it much more interesting than if it's a project of reproducing a certain conception of the human, which is exactly the conception of the human that's gotten us into all the trouble that we're in now. So, so those I try to sort of hold those things together. Um, and yeah, and John, I'm sure has other thoughts on this. I'm just going to sort of answer in a in a in a way which relates um, uh, quite closely to some of my work that was seen in the in the video. I, I think you can see that there's a, 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 a quite a disposition in that for um, getting down to components, getting down to raw materials uh, for for touch for um, a whole load of old crap bumping into each other and seeing what happens and uh uh there's a, in particular there there's a collaboration that i have ongoing with uh, uh robin foster uh he has a a, a, a practice for the that he's been engaged in for the last sort of 10 years or so which he calls rummaging uh which is pretty much what it says uh and he he tends to put things in a box and he tends to rummage them around and actually relating back to the previous question as well this he does this in a quite a 
a ritualistic way uh, with an idea of repeated gestures, repeated gestures. But the repeated gestures are against a whole load of uh, um, uh, scrap that's typically gathered on gig day. And, uh, and so there's difference within the repetition and the, the box eventually breaks and the things come out and, and the performance finishes. Um, and, but, and, and, and in the work with him, I'm connecting up my little synthesizers by just taking bare wires and stuffing them in the box. Uh, and that's my idea of inf interfacing, or at least that's a kind of theater, a kind of dramatization of how uh, interfacing could occur. And, uh, and I think in my creative work, that's the kind of turn I take uh, to try and, and, and think of things that one could make or uh, uh, which uh, tend to have are not boxed. So uh, um, uh, Steve Wolgar made much about uh, in the configuring the user piece back in 1980, whatever it was, about the box. Uh, and the box as a symbolic boundary between uh, the user and the organization who make the technology within, no user serviceable parts within. Well, every user part, every part is user serviceable as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I'm actually trying to make things which just dramatize uh, that possibility. Uh, sometimes I refer to things as being that the object uh, that I make is the unmade. Uh, you know, with, with sort of reference uh, to Duchamp with his ready-mades. I'm interested in the unmade, uh, the things which are on the way uh, to perhaps to being made or on the way from being made. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, and, 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 uh, as I say, so the, the, the strategy of taking as an aesthetic strategy, the dramatization, the theatricality, the performativity of uh, of interfacing, I, I, I think is, is, is something I'd advocate. Absolutely, yeah. Great. So we we'll probably have time for one more question. Is there anybody with a question? I have several, if you don't. But I do welcome, yeah, Len, perfect. Do you, do you want to come up closer here? And just in case. you can hear me um, thank you for both of your your, your uh, presentations um, I'm interested I guess you know we see yeah we see things like more than human design or entanglement HCI cropping up now so I'm curious about the relay of these critical approaches into mainstream design actionable approaches what what do you see happening there does something get lost in the transfer Great. thank you yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a huge issue. Um, the, uh, the the appropriation, the capacities for appropriation of, <laughs> of of capitalism, basically, you know, are are clear and and um, ever present, and and the the kind of domestication and normalization of a lot of of ideas that are initially kind of counter ideas and that are trying to to to, to interrupt things and. Uh, and then get domesticated and sort of, you know, user experience design, et cetera, um, all of those things. Ethics at the moment uh, is an industry, a huge industry. And there is some really wonderful um, counter critical work um, being done uh, in relation to, um, by, by, so I'm thinking of, of people like David Weider. I don't know if you, if you know him, but he, He's been writing about um, these, he, he has a, a um, PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon, and he's now doing a postdoc at, at Cornell Tech in New York City. So he's very much in the belly of the beast, but all of his work is um, basically in, in pushing back in opposition to these processes of domestication, including, including of ethics and the difference between ethics as um, even the best uh, guidelines, um, uh, check tick box um, models, and so forth. And again, he refers back to to Phil Agri and the idea of a critical technical practice. This as as always already built in the politics of of, of technology is always already built in as something that that um, technologists have to always be engaging with and. Uh, so I think those are really important directions, and 
um, we need a lot of skepticism and we need a lot of questioning about um, what appear to be the responses to the previous calls um, <laughs> for change. Uh, that, so that's a kind of ongoing cycle, I think. Yeah, the, the um, human computer interaction research has a long tradition of appropriation, a long tradition of, uh, of, 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 of taking terms. Uh, so the, the social term, uh, well, first of all, the cognitive term in the foundation of HCI to w pull certain issues uh, 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 away from uh, uh, traditional studies of ergonomics. Uh, so a cognitive turn was taken to pull things out of ergonomics to to have a psycholo specifically psychological discourse uh, 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 about questions of design, and then we ha then we have a social turn which pulls some of those same issues into sociological concerns, into uh, uh, into um, uh, ethnographic concerns, into empirical social scientific concerns. And then there might have been a, a design turn when, uh, uh, when, when design discourses and artistic discourses get mobilized. Um, uh, I mean, quite a few people have talked to various waves of human computer interaction research. And I have to admit that I'm Jeff Cooper and I wrote a paper in uh, 1985, uh, 90, 95, 95, I get confused these days, uh, where we where we characterized two waves of HCI, one, a, you know, a cognitive psychological one, a sociological one. And, uh, uh, and, and now people are talking about third and fourth and fifth and sixth waves of, of research. Um, and that kind of schematization, that kind of uh, of, of history, um, uh, is, is, is troubling uh, because it can lead to one thinking about uh, all of the contributions with it from a particular orientation as being effectively the same. Um, it's, uh, uh, and so, for example, uh, uh, the discourses about entanglement, uh, uh, which are, uh, are, you know, are, are becoming commonplace in human computer interaction. There's very many different kinds of ways of talking there very many different kinds of ways of talking and and not so many of them uh you know uh, uh talk about quantum level events uh like karen barad does uh, uh and making relationships uh, through you know a, a particular analysis of of, of a quantum ent entanglement to to sociological and uh phenomena of of, of political net character as well now that's that's a that's a I mean her their work is a very um, uh, 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 detailed path. Not so many people follow that. Uh, so yes, all of these things have to I think come with a warning, and and the necessity is is to look at the details of particular practitioners, uh, and I think that's the necessity mm -hmm. um, yeah. because it's very easy to uh, appropriate uh, different kinds of thought. Um, and uh, and put it to service uh, in in certain kinds of interdisciplinary zones, uh, yeah. which can actually sometimes make it appropriable in further turn in ways yeah. that one would not. I, wish. And I, I think the other the other part of that is an insistence on the uh, working against the depoliticization of because that yes. that that a big part of the appropriation is the stripping away of the 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 policy politics or small p politics of design of, of computing and so forth. And that's that insistence that these things are that that politics are an integral and inescapable <laughs> um, element of, of these practices and that there's something that has to be part of the practice um, is, is the, the, th the thing I think that part of, of the critical thing that makes that difference between a critical practice and an appropriation into business as usual, basically. Great. Great. I think that's an ideal place to end for now. I'm yes. looking forward to enjoy this, your dinners. This this conversation <laughs> continuing. Enjoy enjoy your lunch, Lucy, if you haven't had it already. And, and please give them one last round of applause. Hi, John. <laughs> I'm applauding you, Lucy. I'm applauding yeah, you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and the audience, you know. Yes. yes, thank you so much. They were great. They were great. Great. Uh, so hopefully some, see some of you at Horse Lords uh, at the Black Box. It's the closing, closing event for Sonorities. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Go get some food. Right.
<laughs> Bye for now, Paul. Bye for now.